Hello viewers and welcome again to Discovering Truth and I am Pastor Forbes from the Gateway Abiding Word Ministries here in the Gambia. I want to just have an easy discussion on a subject which I'm sure would be of benefit to each one of us, especially when you have a heart for your country, you have a desire for things to be good, be better, and to be the best that they can as much as possible in your time, in your lifetime. As a person of faith, I believe, and largely our population believes in the hereafter, believes in life after death, and believes in consequences, if you like, retribution of how we live here in this part of eternity called time and space, as brief as it is compared to eternity, that we all by and large believe that there are effects, consequences in the hereafter. That principle itself is true. It just needs to be positioned within what God says. Because our general thought, <coughs> excuse me, and the general religious belief of people is that it's a game of balances. The more good I do until it outweighs the bad I tend to do will give me a place and a good place in eternity. That in itself positionally is incorrect because we all know that in the early days of creation, when our forebears, Adam and Eve, sinned, their sin introduced a nature, a defect. I always like to call it a congenital defect. So it comes with the birth of every human being. And that shifted and skewed and distorted the original purity, perfection that we had. A perfection and purity and authenticity that never made us competitive, never made us vindictive, never made us want to dominate each other, and never made us fear God. As you read the account in the first book of the Bible, the book of the beginnings, Genesis, it gives us the understanding that man, Adam, Adama and his wife, who later became Eve, they fellowship, they had communion with God. There was no fear of the fire and the glory and the power that follows the Almighty God. Because the Almighty God is not circumscribed by time and space. But in the perfection and purity and uniqueness of their creation, they were free. It is only when they submitted that freedom to a lie that everything changed. And what was originally good in them was now tainted with sin. And so until that nature and lifestyle and reality becomes permanently changed, even what they were called good, even what you and I call good, in the eyes of a perfect, holy, righteous, sinless, pure God, will be seen. In fact, there is a book of the Bible called Isaiah, the 64th chapter, Isaiah 64, I believe it's verse 4, thereabout. It says that all our good deeds, all our righteous deeds, all our tryings to be righteous, 
in the eyes of God is the same as filthy rags. More so would tell him. Dirty, dirty cloth. The best of it. And so that collectively needs a transformation, a change, a total cleansing for it to be accepted to God. So the thought that my good will outweigh my bad is really a fallacy because in itself, no man is good in himself. That is why in the book of Job, Job cried when he had his difficult times. He said, oh, that there was an umpire. Oh, that there was a referee. I, had, I, I wish I had a day's man. And then he goes on to say, somebody who would umpire between me and God, and he will hold God on this side, hold me on this side, bring us together so he can judge our case. And, and that's what we look for in judges, in magistrates, in counselors, in, in peacemakers, in arbitrators. We look for people who have the quality that makes them qualify to understand both sides. And ladies and gentlemen, the purest of it all is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he came, God, as man, Messiah, Christus, Christ, Al-Masihu. He came, so he understood man with the feelings and the frailties of man, yet he was God. And he became the reconciler on the cross. Now, Anything that is going to sound good or anything that's going to be ticked by God as good has to pass through that reconciliation process. There are books in the Bible that are known as first and second. One of them is even first, second, and third. In the New Testament, there is first and second Corinthians. In second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, from verse 17, it goes down and says, Therefore, if any person is inside Christ Jesus, the person is a new creation. He is a new being or a new species of being that never existed before. So you point a finger on her bad life, on his past life, on what they did in 1982. God says it doesn't exist before me because the person is a new creation. The person is brand new in my eyes but they are only brand new through Christ Jesus, through the Messiah. And that is why you can understand when the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So the, the methodology of our cleansing to give us the right to say now what I'm doing is good and it will weigh for my good. That methodology is Christ Jesus, his blood, his death, his resurrection and his life for us. And anything like that is trying to jump that process and that does not cut it with Almighty God. Not for me, not for you, not for anybody, not for any religious person who tells us that. Because in ourselves we are not good. Look at our world. A lot of the trouble that goes on in our world even stems from the people who are in leadership, who we expect to know better. The people who cause poverty, who cause untold lack and suffering and greed are the wealthy people. Because the more the poor people are like that, the more they have reason to palliate their consciences to do what we talk about poverty. If we were serious about erasing poverty, eradicating poverty, we will do it. Because each year, Oxfam and groups like that, they give us the, 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 the statistics. 64 people of this world own more than what the 7.89 billion of us own together. We still have the problem. There are institutions that the day poverty is eradicated, they become obsolete. So it is in their interest for it to continue. So ladies and gentlemen, good in ourselves, nobody is good in himself except they come through the salvation plan of God through the Messiah Christ. That is when there is a 
heart surgery. If any person be in Christ, he is a new creation. It goes on to say, the old is passed away. See, behold, observe, everything has now become new. And then it goes on to say in that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, down from 17 to 21, that what could not be done in the flesh because it was weakened, God did through Jesus Christ. And then it beautifully puts this verse. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we in his place will become the righteousness of of God through him, Jesus Christ. I take it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's this game changer scripture for our lives. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, made him the sacrificial sin for us, substitutionally taking our sin upon his body, dying on the cross. Don't let anybody deceive you that he didn't. He died on the cross. That was a substitutionary plan for God and man from when Adam and his wife missed it in the garden and brought this sin congenital defect that dented anything we do. Doesn't it amaze you that sometimes you can see somebody laughing one minute, the next minute they're ready to kill. Somebody is praying and immediately after prayer they're ready to kill and fight. You wonder, is this schizophrenia? Is it bipolar? Is it split personality? You know, it's just the fallen human nature that needs salvation, redemption, change, transformation through Jesus Christ. And the provision is already there. I'm so glad that that became my reality many years ago, 44 years ago, in 1979 August. So all these things people say, Pastor Forbes, you're a lot me, God game, God OPE aid. No, 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 no. It's a salvation reality. And so how does it work? In the book of James, named after one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. In the fourth chapter and the seventh verse, I want to read, sorry, the eighth verse. James chapter four, verse eight. I want to read the first half. And this is what it says. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. There are many other things it says, like cleansing your hands, purifying yourself, weeping and mourning and God opposes the proud and that's all true but I'm just pitching my tent on James 4 8 you can google it my friend James J-A-M-E-S space bar 4 colon 8 or instead of colon write verse 8 and you'll see it whichever translation of the Bible comes up come close to God and he will come close to you ladies and gentlemen how many of us know that God is waiting for us? There are things you want. There are things I want. There are things we want for our country. Sometimes we all know the problem. One of the pet phrases you hear in almost every African's lips is this phrase. The problem, the problem of Gambia is the problem of Ghana is, the problem of Nigeria is, you see, the problem with South Africa is, the problem with Africa is, the problem with the black man is, the problem with the white man is. We know the problem, and more often than not, we are right. But the solution, one key solution is this little verse talked in this book of five chapters, James towards the end of the New Testament of the Bible, he says, if you draw near to me, decide and determine and deliberately come close to me, I will also come close to you. And ladies and gentlemen, when we come close to God, we are implicitly saying, I cannot solve it. I do not have the answers. 
I have tried and have failed. I am about giving up. I am about resigning. I am quitting. This is never going to work. I will never see prosperity in my generations. We are doomed to fail. We are a cursed people, etc., etc., etc. But I'm drawing close to you because I know with you there is help, there are answers, there is a solution. You are the way maker, you are the promise keeper. You can turn situations around. And ladies and gentlemen, for every individual who has done this and done it from the sincerity, truth of their heart will tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, including me with my hand up, that this scripture is true. When you draw close to God and be vulnerable to him and ask him for help, ask him for answers, Ask him to open the eyes of your understanding that you see as he sees. You see from his vantage position. You understand the divine perspective to even global challenges. Because you can beat your chest before or against and join global media frenzy and all that. And it's just man's perspective. This world is so interesting that on Monday we can all be on one side and on Tuesday suddenly everybody goes on another side and Wednesday, oh, we we're not sure. We thought and thought, say, well, we, we, we can do that. Because the truth is we do not know. We are circumscribed by time, by space. And sometimes, you know, he who pays the piper dictates the tune and the speed and how loud the tune can be paid. He doesn't mean that they are right. If we draw near to God and draw as people, draw as individuals, come close as a family and say, Almighty God, I have tried. I am tired. I have done everything. I am fed up. I give up. Do you remember if you are familiar with the Bible, our Savior, our Messiah had an encounter with Peter and told Peter, cast your net into the water. And Peter was like, no, no, no. Don't tell me that. We have been fishing all night long and we have caught nothing. We are the fishermen. We are the experts. We know. But this has defied us all night long and we have caught nothing. And then Peter said, but nevertheless, at your word, I am drawing close to you with everything I want to be able to unload my problems, bear my heart out to you, cry before you, break down before you, throw my hand, hands in the air, even throw a tantrum before you, leaving, leaving an opening that tells me that you can sort it all out. Draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. When we draw nigh unto God, we understand he's the Almighty. We understand he can solve every situation. We understand nothing happens without his knowledge sometimes and permission. We understand that there is no man, there is no woman, there is no situation, there is no condition, there is no scenario that he cannot change, transform, improve upon. But we need to draw nigh to him. There are very few scenarios where people are going to come against your will, overpower your will to help you. It's not natural. It's not natural. If you are invited to a court of law, you are expected to go there if you are proving difficult, that is when a subpoena is given and sometimes a bench warrant to arrest you and bring you by force. That's not how it's supposed to be. Draw nigh to God yourself. So are you trying to solve your own problems? Are you bewildered? Are you stressed? Are you frustrated? Have you tried all kinds of answers, all kinds of scenarios, 
all kinds of methodologies. Have you found yourself, excuse the language, running up and down like a headless chicken, walking here, going there, doing this, everybody says this, everybody says that you've tried it all, and sometimes you come back, you are tired. God says, just draw nigh to me. How do we do it? It's a simple prayer. Say, Lord, I cannot do it by myself. I'm tired. I need help. And also, I have been told that you provided a solution for me, a salvation plan, a salvation package through the Messiah, Christ, the Alma who Jesus Christ himself, for me. When you say that, you are drawing nigh to God. And it's almost like God is saying, this is what I was waiting for. I was waiting for you. I can't come barging in, banging into your life. You have to invite me. In fact, there is a scripture in the last book of the Bible called the Revelations. And there is a verse I want to just take out of its immediate context and apply it here. It's Revelations chapter 3, verse 20 or 21. And it goes like that. Behold, I stand at the door and I am knocking. If anybody hears my voice and my knock and opens the door, to them will I come in, sit with them, fellowship with them, eat with them. He is not going to break doors. He's not going to take this thing that the special forces people do and break the door down. He's not going to connect a hand grenade and blow the door open. No. Because that would be forced entry. And he doesn't want to force you. Because what you are not ready for, when people give you, you'll destroy it. But when you get to that point when you say, I am tired, I want help, Lord. I am coming to you. I am drawing near. He's saying, he will also draw near to you. What would happen? Number one, you will have the sure testimony that God is not far from you. Number two, you will have the sure testimony that you are not far from God. Number three, the effect and the outcome of God being near you will be seen. What is that effect? Change, transformation, salvation, deliverance, healing, turnaround, victory, purposeful living. And everybody will say, wow, she's changed. What happened? He's changed. What happened? He drew nigh to God. She decided to draw nigh to God. And God also drew nigh to them. You know, as I end this first part, I just want us to chat and I'll do two more. Could it be that as you are listening to me this day, from wherever you are, and through whatever medium, could it be that this is the day that will change your life? Because you see, drawing near to God is not a group dynamic, it's not mob mentality, I can I lend them, or let us all go together, I am make we all go, no. It's you taking time to analyze everything in your life, analyzing things and coming to God. And ladies and gentlemen, if we do that as individuals, families, companies, people in leadership, all the way up to the presidencies, into the palaces, into the state houses, into the parliament houses, into the legal chambers and the courthouses, into cabinet meetings, boardrooms, we all come to the point when we say we need help. It will happen. And that is why starting a meeting with prayer must not just be a religious, traditional thing that we do. Christian prayer, Muslim prayer. It must be invoking the presence and the hand of God for divine wisdom, understanding, discernment concerning the matter at hand. And when we ask him in sincerity and draw nigh to him through his prescribed method, 
we will have the answers. I want to stop here, and by the grace of God, I'll continue next week and scale it up to the larger you, the larger me, the collective you and me, and that is our nation, our communities, and our society. Until I come your way next week, by the grace of God, I pray this will be sinking deep and somebody today will make that decision to come close to God and ask God to come close to you through Christ and Christ alone. Have a good day.